Welcome to Introductory Algebra-Based Mechanics. Uh, in this course, we will uh, be taking a look at mechanics, so the motion of objects, also how they interact, and we will be touching at, at the end of the series on thermodynamics and waves and fluid flow. Um, so we'll start by defining the subject. Um, the usual definition I like to go with is that physics is the study of the basic components of the universe and their interactions. And what do I mean by a basic component? Here I'm talking about the building blocks of matter. Um, now we don't know you know, we have a pretty good idea what the basic building blocks of matter are, but it's always subject to revision. So the best model we have at the moment um, is that there are particles, as an example, we can look at particles called quarks, and another class of particles called leptons. Now, an example of a lepton is an electron, which you may have heard of. That's the particle that orbits the nucleus of an atom. Quarks, you're probably less likely to have heard of. Um, it sadly is not a reference to the German word for yogurt cheese. It is actually a reference to a, a, a story called Finnegan's Wake written by James Joyce. Um, and there is a reference to the word quark in there, and this word came from that reference, but that's neither here nor there. Um, it turns out that combinations of these quarks can go to make things that you probably have heard of, um, protons and neutrons. Now, how do these quarks interact? Um, and so, in, in order to make protons and neutrons, it turns out that these quarks will interact via a force called the strong nuclear force. Which, if you go on to the next course in the sequence, We'll touch on it very briefly um, near the end of the course. Um, it also, the existence of a strong nuclear force implies the existence of a weak nuclear force, and you would be correct about that. Um, that turns out to regulate certain kinds of, uh, of decays that are applicable to things like radio medicine and stuff like that. Um, anyway, we, once we make these protons and neutrons, again, via the strong nuclear force, we can, say, put them together to make a nucleus. And then these electrons and nuclei can interact via the electromagnetic force. Technically, we should be talking about the electroweak force. Um, it turns out that the weak nuclear force I was just referencing is an aspect of the electromagnetic force, but we don't really need to get into that here. And that's something that, again, we would be looking at in the next course. Um, anyway, we can start putting electrons in orbit around nuclei to make atoms. And then again, via the electric aspect of the electromagnetic force, these atoms can go to make molecules. And then these molecules can combine together to form structures such as cells. These cells can combine together to form a physicist who worries about all of this stuff. Um, once we get to big enough scales, things on the size order of planets, um, then gravity 
will start to matter. Um, gravity is a bit of a puzzling force in that it is much weaker, much, much weaker than the other forces in nature that we know about. And we're not entirely sure why that is. It's an open research uh, topic. But anyway, the upshot here is that we can give these building blocks names like quarks and leptons. There are suggestions that there may be things more fundamental, such as strings, for instance. But that's a an avenue of theoretical research. Um, the but these these are sort of like our tinker toys that we can use to combine things together into more and more complicated objects. And these different forces that I've given names to are the way these objects interact. And that's in this field of physics is the study of that. Now, one other thing that I want to get into in this particular video is a thing called an operational definition. And probably the best way to think about it is to try to come up with for yourself a definition of time. Just ask yourself, what is time? In fact, what I would like you to do right now, and this is something that I'll be doing a fair amount in these videos, is I would like you to actually pause the video for a bit and come up with a definition. And then when you're ready, go ahead and resume. Okay. Probably had a uh, bit of a struggle defining time. And it turns out you're not alone. Um, Sir Isaac Newton in his uh, Principia, which is where he laid down the foundations of mechanics, which is what the the bulk of the subject that we'll be studying in this course. He, he was really challenged in trying to define time. Um, went on for quite a while, and then basically at the end of it said, ah, you know what I mean. Um, and this is actually a bit of a problem because this we don't know what it is. Sometimes we need to be able to talk about things that we don't know what they actually are, but we need to do it in a way that everyone can agree on it. And so we do have a, def a universally agreed upon definition of time, and it is that sign that a clock measures. And this might seem like some sort of a cheesy cop-out, but it really isn't. We only know time via our experience of it. And it is a open research topic to figure out what time is. Um, it was only about a little over a century ago that we started to figure out that space and time were not separate things, but were somehow interconnected. Um, that was the result of good 400 years of work. Nature isn't giving up her secrets on this stuff very quickly. And so we need to have some strict way of being able to define things rather than just pulling a Newton and basically saying, ah, oh, you know what I mean. So we can give a nice rigorous step-by-step -step definition, for instance, of elapsed time. Uh, 
Um, we get a nice little step-by-step -step recipe. Step one, set clock to zero. Step two, turn clock on. When event starts. Step three, turn clock off when the event stops. And then step four, read the number on the dial. So with that, in place. And we can do similar things for length. Um, it turns out that we don't need to operationally define a ton of things. In fact, the main operationally defined quantities, what we call the base quantities, Um, dial down to about seven of them. Um, they are mass, length, so that thing measured by balance, that thing measured by a meter stick, time, that thing measured by a clock, temperature, that thing measured by a thermometer, but we've got better, more precise definitions now, but we can use that for now. Um, we'll be worried about these in this class. Um, we won't be worried about electric current. Um, that one will show up in the next course. Um, we pretty much won't be worried at all about luminous intensity in either course. Um, in this course, though, we will worry about the amount of a substance. So these are, it turns out that with these seven operationally defined signs, absolutely everything else we build up in physics, we can leverage off of those operational definitions. So it isn't as bad as it might look. This, you can kind of think of this as sort of the physics equivalent of an axiom. So if the difference is in it with an axiom in math, that was something presented as a universal truth. Here, these are quantities that we have to define operationally. And actually, we'll see that within very recently um, with some changes to the metric system. Some of these quantities that uh, we still think of casually is defined operationally um, can actually be folded now into other things. So really the list now isn't even as long as seven. But with that, uh, in the next video, we'll go and take a look at um, units and why they matter. So catch you in the next one.